of those mighty acts whereby you have given us life and immortality through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus and his disciples had come near to Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them. And he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. 
A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet, Jesus, from Nazareth in Galilee. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. On this day he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed as King of Kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along his way. Let these branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our king and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns in glory with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest.
Lord be with you. And, and also, also with, with you. you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to Matthew One of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I betray Jesus to you? The priests paid him thirty pieces of silver, and from that moment Judas began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, When do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? Jesus said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, Jesus took his place with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And the disciples became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to his disciples, You will all become deserters because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will get it go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, Jesus threw himself on the ground and prayed. My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, 
Jesus went away for the second time and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, Jesus came and found the disciples sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given the crowd a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once, Judas came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then the crowd came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted Jesus and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, Peter sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to Jesus, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his his blasphemy. What is your verdict? The scribes and elders answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in Jesus' face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, you also were with the Jesus, with Jesus the Galilean. But Peter denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you're talking about. When Peter went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. 
Um, sorry. Then Peter began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. Judas said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But the chief priests and elders said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, Judas departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set the price and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when Jesus was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But Jesus gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to the crowd, whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For Pilate realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests and the elders had handed Jesus over. While Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him. Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? And the crowd said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then Pilate asked, Why? What evil has he done? But the crowd shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So Pilate released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped Jesus and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. 
they put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on Jesus and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, the soldiers came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry Jesus' cross. And when the soldiers came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over Jesus' head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with Jesus, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking Jesus, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if God wants to. For this man said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with Jesus also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him, who were keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly this man was God's son. Many women were also there, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. Joseph went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. Joseph then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that imposter said while he was still alive. He said, After three days I will rise again. 
Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, Jesus' disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people, He has been raised from the dead. And the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. to not have a sermon on this day and to let the Passion Gospel speak for itself. But under the circumstances that we're in this week, I felt it appropriate to say something. And a meditation that I was reading this week particularly spoke to me. It is by Henri Nouwen, the uh, Catholic priest and spiritual writer in a wonderful collection called Bread and Wine, Readings for Lent and Easter that I commend to you. And it's a selection of writings from various authors. And uh, this chapter from All We Now In is called From Action to Passion. And these are excerpts from that chapter. I was invited to visit a friend who was very sick. He was a man about 53 years old who had lived a very active, useful, faithful, creative life. Actually, he was a social activist who had cared deeply for people. When he was 50, he found out he had cancer, and the cancer became more and more severe. When I came to him, he said to me, Henri, here I am lying in this bed, and I don't even know how to think about being sick. My whole way of thinking about myself is in terms of action, in terms of doing things for people. My life is valuable because I've been able to do many things for many people. And suddenly here I am, passive, and I can't do anything anymore. And he said to me, help me to think about this situation in a new way. Help me to think about my not being able to do anything anymore, so I won't be driven to despair. Help me to understand what it means that now all sorts of people are doing things to me over which I have no control. As we talked, I realized that he and many others were constantly thinking, how much can I still do? Somehow this man had learned to think about himself as a man who was worth only what he was doing. And so when he got sick, his hope seemed to rest on the idea that he might get better and return to what he had been doing. If the spirit of this man was dependent on how much he would still be able to do, what did I have to say to him? The central word in the story of Jesus' arrest is one I never thought much about. It is to be handed over. 
That is what happened in Gethsemane. Jesus was handed over. Some translations say that Jesus was betrayed, but the Greek says he was handed over. Judas handed Jesus over. See Mark 14, verse 10. But the remarkable thing is that the same word is used not only for Judas, but also for God. God did not spare Jesus, but handed him over to benefit us all. See Romans 8, verse 32. So this word, to be handed over, plays a central role in the life of Jesus. Indeed, this drama of being handed over divides the life of Jesus radically in two. The first part of Jesus' life is filled with activity. Jesus takes all sorts of initiatives. He speaks, he preaches, he heals, he travels. But immediately after Jesus is handed over, he becomes the one to whom things are being done. He's being arrested. He's being led to the high priest. He's being taken before Pilate. He's being crowned with thorns. He's being nailed on a cross. Things are being done to him over which he has no control. That is the meaning of passion, being the recipient of other people's initiatives. Passion is a kind of waiting, waiting for what other people are going to do. Jesus went to Jerusalem to announce the good news to the people of that city. And Jesus knew that he was going to put a choice before them. Will you be my disciples, or will you be my executioner? There is no middle ground here. Jesus went to Jerusalem to put people in a situation where they had to say yes or no. That is the great drama of Jesus' passion. He had to wait upon how people were going to respond. How would they come? To betray him? or to follow him. In a way, his agony is not simply the agony of approaching death. It is also the agony of having to wait. All action ends in passion because the response to our action is out of our hands. That is the mystery of work, the mystery of love, the mystery of friendship, the mystery of community. They always involve waiting. And that is the mystery of Jesus' love. God reveals himself in Jesus as the one waits for our response. Precisely in that waiting, the intensity of God's love is revealed to us. If God forced us to love, we would not really be lovers. All these insights into Jesus' passion were very important in the discussion with my friend. He realized that having much hard work, that after much hard work, he had to wait. He came to see that his vocation as a human being would be fulfilled, not just in his actions, but also in his passion. And together, we began to understand that precisely in this waiting, the glory of God and our new life both became visible. The Son of Man, Jesus says, must be lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. From John 3, verses 14 and 15. He is lifted up as a passive victim, so the cross is a sign of desolation. And he is lifted up in glory, so the cross becomes at the same time a sign of hope. Suddenly we realize that the glory of God, the divinity of God, bursts through in Jesus' passion precisely when he is most victimized. So new life becomes visible not only in the resurrection on the third day, but already in the passion, in the being handed over. Why? Because it is in the passion that the fullness of God's love shines through. It is supremely a waiting love, a love that does not seek control. 
when we allow ourselves to feel fully how we are being acted upon, we can come in touch with a new life that we were not even aware was there. This was the question my sick friend and I talked about constantly. Could he taste the new life in the midst of his passion? Could he see that in his being acted upon by the hospital staff, he was already being prepared for a deeper love? It was a love that he had, that had been underneath all the action, but he had not tasted it fully. So together we began to see that in the midst of our suffering and passion, in the midst of our waiting, we can already experience the resurrection. Imagine how important that message is for people in our world. If it is true that God in Jesus Christ is waiting for our response to divine love, then we can discover a whole new perspective on how to wait in life. We can learn to be obedient people who do not always try to go back to the action, but who recognize the fulfillment of our deepest humanity in passion, in waiting. If we can do this, I am convinced that we will come in touch with the glory of God and our own new life. Then our service to others will include our helping them see the glory breaking through not only where they are active, but also where they are being acted upon. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love and be found without fault at the day of your coming, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, For Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Alan, and Gail, our own bishops. For Ellie, our clergy, for all bishops and other ministers, and for all the holy people of God, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord for all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease, and that all may be one, as you and the Father are one. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, For those who do not yet believe, and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, For those in positions of public trust, especially Donald, our president, and Charlie, our governor, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a blessing upon all human labor and for the right use of the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, for those who are present and for those who are absent, that we may be delivered from hardness of heart 
and show forth your glory in all that we do. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord mercy. For all who have commended themselves to our prayers, especially Brian, Eric, Michael, Chris, Catherine, Ella and Ezra, Christina, Elizabeth, Laura, Gino, Ida, Sharon, Diane, Vesna, Patricia, for our families, friends, and neighbors, that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace, and health. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord Facing the coronavirus, we pray for all who mourn their dead, for the thousands who have contracted the virus, for all who are quarantined, for those who are stranded away from home, for those who have lost their employment, for those who fear the present and the future, for children who cannot assemble for school, for parents with needs for child care, for physicians, nurses, and home health aides, for hospitals and clinics, for volunteers who are serving their communities, for medical researchers, for the World Health Organization, for adequate and wise government policies, for these and all concerns of our hearts, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. For Mary Bird, Louise Lawrence, Fran Elliott, for all who have died in the communion of your church, and for those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
lift up your hearts. Let, let, the Lord. let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to have God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, for our sins he was lifted high upon the cross, that he might draw the whole world to himself. And by his suffering and death, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who put their trust in him. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, Come at least spiritually into my heart. As though you have already come, I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
Let us 